Uh, again, my name is Doug Sponhorst. I'm with the USDA ARS Sugarcane Research Unit, and uh, I do the my primary role is the, the herbicide work for sugarcane. And a lot of my work, uh, I work in collaboration with Al Ogeron from the LSU Ag Center. So there are several difficult uh, to control weed species in sugarcane. And I think uh, arguably uh, a lot of growers would agree that itchgrass is probably the most dominant and most problematic uh, weed to control in cane, uh, mostly because of its competitive nature and robust seed production. So it's been a problem for a long time. Uh, I think it was uh, became really prominent in the 1950s around some railroad tracks in the St. Martinville area. And uh, itchgrass, it reproduces by seed and it is an annual C4 grass. And sunlight really influences germination. And the majority of flushes that we see germinate at daytime temperatures around 80 degrees and evening temperatures around 60. I was actually in St. Martinville yesterday looking at a field where there's been a history of it and I actually found a couple plants beginning to emerge there. So um, I'm of the opinion that it germinates year round, uh, even you know, that far north. As I mentioned earlier, you know, light can influence seed germination and this is a uh, graph that I pulled from uh, a manuscript by E.K. et al. 2011. And the, the, the highlight here is where you have periods of sunlight, dark, sunlight, dark. Uh, there seems to be a, a significant increase in itchgrass seed germination. And the period of time where we typically see this periods of light and dark in our cropping system is after the cane is harvested and until the grand growth stage. Once we get into that grand growth stage, uh, the amount of sunlight that penetrates the soil surface is considerably lower. And I got to thinking about uh, a question at the uh, sugarcane research and extension meeting the other week where people were talking about bush hogging plant cane with all the material there. And for itch grass management, um, I would think this is probably not the best idea uh, because you already have that well-developed uh, cane canopy uh, to really provide a lot of shading and hopefully prevent that sunlight from reaching the soil surface and promoting its grass germination, especially if that cane is, is you know, really green and appears to be actively growing. If we look at our, our current uh, pre-emergent herbicide toolbox. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of tools here, but I say we got some pretty important ones. You know, pendimethalin, it's like a number two Phillips, trifluralin, a crescent wrench, and uh, clomazone, you know, it's almost like having a pry bar. So we got some really good tools, um, but we don't have a whole lot of them that in my opinion are uh, really exceptional products. Uh, Metribuzin, uh, we, we have seen some activity with it pre-emergent, but it obviously doesn't stand up to uh, those, those active ingredients in the green box. <clears throat> Post-emergence, uh, again, we're, we're really limited to Agilox and uh, Invoke, which is trifloxysulfuron. Um, and then the combination of the two uh, really can do a, mar a remarkable job. Uh, keep in mind that uh, with Agilox, once we get into June, we can really uh, cause injury to the crop, potentially more injury on a broadcast application than maybe what uh, yield loss we might sustain from, from itch grass competition. So, you know, you need to evaluate each, each situation there, whether uh, those applications are, are warranted or not. And then when itch grass is very small, uh, I have heard folks tell me that they've had some, some good activity with Metribuzin post-emergent. But again, that's, that's very small, probably an inch uh, in size or, or no greater than that. And so this kind of uh, goes on to uh, a project that this is the second year of doing this study and, and a grower up in the Cade, Louisiana area came to us, Al and I, and said, you know, I, I'm getting some activity with our pre-emergent herbicides command in particular, which is on the right-hand side, but you know, I'm still seeing quite a few escapes. And with any pre-emergent herbicide, you know, it's not 
it's not going to knock out every single uh, itch grass seedling there. Uh, just based on the emergence pattern of the weed and the dissipation of those and breakdown of those products uh, over time, uh, you're going, I would expect to see uh, itch grass emerge, especially in situations where you have a, a really heavy and plentiful seed bank, as you can see in this, in this photo here, where we had no pre-emergent herbicide on that row right in the middle. Quite a bit of itch grass coming up there. So with that being said, the grower was asking, you know, it's quite expensive to put out command. You know, is there any other options that, you know, I could do? And it kind of uh, begged the question, you know, is there a fit for Paraquat in this situation? You know, the cane growth uh, after planting, at least for, you know, four weeks is, is extremely low. Can we get the itch grass to emerge and, uh, and tackle it after that? This is a little bit of thinking on this. And, you know, it's, it is really a non-conventional approach. Um, and if you're a gambler, it, it, it's a little risky, in my opinion. Uh, we just go, go back to 2018. Uh, I know a lot of uh, growers out there can remember 2018. It was an extremely wet, wet grinding season. And it begs the question, you know, am I able to get back into that field? Um, and then would I be able to make a timely application with Paraquat? Paraquat's a contact uh, herbicide. So, so coverage is uh, very important. Herbicide coverage is very important for this, for this chemistry. It's non-selective, which, uh, you know, we're going to get cane injury. And I'm, am I willing to accept that? Uh, Paraquat also requires with, <clears throat> with the new products, uh, a training. And, you know, aircraft application of this material uh, in cane may, may not be legal in the future. So those are all things to kind of think about. And, and Paraquat is it's becoming more restrictive with that, with that uh, chemistry just based on the toxicity of it and, and the issues with, you know, accidental poisonings, especially in, in third world countries and also, you know, here in the US. So with this uh, experiment, we, uh, we have seven treatments and we're looking at just kind of a post application of Agilox or Helmquat. And then we have uh, those two herbicides mixed with a residual, Prow. And then we have uh, a two shot program. Uh, so as you can see, the further down you get on this list, the more aggressive of an approach you have. And again, this is, this is at planting. So with this study, just to kind of give you a little bit of the, uh, of the breakdown of how it was conducted, you know, we had 299, it was planted in, in September the first year, early September and the latter part of August in uh, last year. Again, we had no pre-emergent herbicide. Our first post-emergence applications occurred October 1 in 2019 and uh, September 7th in 2020. So the itch grass at this point in time was, uh, very small, as you can see in the picture on your right, about the V1 growth stage and probably no greater than one inch in height. Sugarcane emergence was uh, really low, which is good because uh, we're not gonna get as much uh, injury uh, from that paraquat application. Now our second post application uh, for the treatment number six and seven that I had in the table uh, previously occurred in the latter part of October in 2019 and late September in 2020. Now the itchgrass stage did vary a little bit more, uh, one to two inch in size and anywhere from just a merge to a uh, three leaf stage. And there was more cane emergence at this point in time. And the dewlap size was uh, approximately one inch. So for the results that I'm gonna present today, uh, we actually went in and, and we, we counted all of the itch grass that emerged within uh, a certain area. Now, the picture on the right, that's ryegrass, but I just kind of wanted to uh, uh, show you, you know, just a, a visual of actually, you know, getting in there counting each individual uh, itch grass seedling that came up. We counted those uh, itch grass plants at two times, uh, 21 days after the first treatment. Then we counted all the plots again, 21 days after the second treatment which corresponded to 42 days after just the single uh, application treatments. So in the next table, um, 
values that you see closer to 100, you know, you can visually think of those as really clean plots, uh, essentially no itch grass. But values closer to zero, you know, think of those as dirty plots or heavily infested with itch grass. So the density reduction data 21 days after the first treatment, uh, you know, we saw a 65 to 89% reduction in itch grass density. And we only saw a significant difference between the helm plot and prowl uh, versus helm plot at 21 days after treatment. And this might have to do with uh, some herbicide coverage potentially. Uh, so 42 or 21 days after the sequential treatment, you know, the, the itch grass density reduction ranged from 60 to 98%. So even with this really aggressive approach, uh, the two shot program with residual, you know, we're, we're not seeing a hundred percent control. Um, but you know, 98 uh, above 85, in my opinion is, is commercially acceptable. So we pictures, uh, pictures tell a thousand words. So 21 days after that second application, um, if you all remember around mid-November, I think it was the 13th of November in 2019, we had a pretty hard freeze across the industry. And uh, you can kind of see the effects of, of that in these photos. So on the far left is our non-treated. Uh, in the middle is a helm quad. And there's quite a bit of itch grass actually on that left shoulder. I know it's a little bit difficult to see in, in these photos just from the freeze damage. But on the far right, uh, you know, exceptional uh, control with the, with the two shot program, which again was similar to our Helm Clot Plus Prowl or Agilox Plus Prowl single application treatment. You know, 2020, yeah, it, in some ways, uh, not in all ways, it was a little bit better. And at, at this location, we had a lot better cane growth, in my opinion. And so I think we're gonna have a, a better results, especially with cane yield. But the non-treated, you can see that on the far left, a lot of those plants are beginning to uh, produce seed and going reproductive. And in the middle with the helm plot alone, again, quite a few uh, itch grass on that shoulder, but you know, looking around on the far right, um, I'm, I'm quite uh, happy with the level of control that we saw with, with that two shot program. And with this, with greater, you know, with better cane growth, a better stand, in my opinion, uh, that two shot program with Paraquat, we did see uh, about 11% uh, visual crop injury. Um, but with the single application 42 days later, uh, the cane really uh, rebounded and, and recovered from that crop injury. So table three, this is just uh, some of the p-values for the treatment effect during the 2019 to 2020 harvest uh, for this particular trial. Now these were all uh, hand cut, hand sampled uh, process samples. So this is estimated cane yield, estimated sugar yield, uh, stock population in June or July, we went out and, and counted all the stocks in each plot. Uh, TRS and fiber, we saw no significant effect um, from our herbicide treatments. Um, and I think in 2021, whenever we harvest these, just based on better cane growth and a better stand, I feel more confident we're going to see some differences with these particular treatments. So some initial findings, um, you know, the crop injury was much more apparent in the 2020 application timing or the 2020 uh, year of the study. Uh, and again, that was because we had a significant freeze um, in 2019. So field conditions, you know, they were quite dry uh, for that first application. Uh, but as we got later on into the season in October, uh, the wheel furrows did become quite tacky. Um, and if we don't include that residual prowl in with that first application, um, we could really run into some issues with uh, itch grass germination, especially if we have uh, warm air temperatures, warm soil, uh, and ample soil moisture. So the prowl plus paraquat uh, treatment was better than uh, paraquat alone at 21 days after treatment. And then the two shot program, it was equal to the single shot program. So uh, in, in this scenario, you know, we really need to go with the most cost effective approach. And, and with that, you know, it would be that single shot prop program with uh, 
Agilox or Helm plot mixed in there with the tank mixture. So just uh, some final thoughts, you know, um, Prowl is very important to our industry, uh, using it at full label use rates and, and based on the soil uh, characteristics, you know, sandy soils versus, you know, higher clay soils, we need to appropriately use the rate for, uh, for each of those soil types. Um, again, poor cane emergence in, in 2020, 2019 to 2020, really limited that yield potential in this study. And again, I'm more optimistic uh, that we're gonna see some treatment differences with the yield components in 2021, just overall due to a better uh, crop establishment. And I wanted to leave you with um, just this table. This is some itchgrass density reduction data. It's taken as a percentage of the non-treated check. So again, the closer to 100 you see, so the, the tall bars, uh, you know, really no itchgrass uh, in those particular plots. And again, anywhere where you see prow here, you know, we're seeing very high levels of, of itch grass control, even when it's mixed with, with, another, with another herbicide. So those, in a lot of cases, you know, the prowl is doing uh, the majority of the heavy lifting there. So with that, if we have um, time for any questions or if you, anybody would, would want to contact me via email, um, I'm happy to, to uh, entertain any questions or discussion. At this point, I have uh, no questions in the chat. Okay.